Mark, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, I've really been looking forward to this conversation with you because I really believe, like we were chatting moments ago, uh, it meets our cultural moment where a lot of people are today stressed out, anxious, yeah. lacking focus. And uh, these are w your words that crisis is a great revealer. So let's start here. Uh, Mark, what has crisis revealed about this cultural moment in the state of our souls? Yeah, I think it's there's two things going on. I think one is... There's a bunch of cultural and I would say increasingly global crises that we're experiencing, but that mm -hmm. then reveals something in us. And I think what that does is often when the things that we unassumedly have put our trust in all of a sudden are stress tested, it puts a stress test on our souls. What do we really mm -hmm. trust in? And so I see this moment, there's a big external thing going on in the world, but then there's an internal dynamic of how we relate to that and what that reveals about us. Mm. What do you think is happening then in and amidst this cultural narrative? Because right now in culture, we hear messaging like trust yourself, get your power back, speak your truth. Um, Freudian ask the locus of authority. And we'll talk about this later. The locus of authority itself. So counter that against what you just said. And how do we navigate through that? Mm. Well, I think it's almost like one of the great myths of our day, which I think you've just outlined there is that you almost got this power inside of you and that's really what's important like the real game is what's happening inside of you and that you have this ability to influence the world to change the world and really it's more about you aligning these different ducks in a right line if you do that success flourishing that's going to be yours but i think what we're discovering and, and i think you know it's been emerging for some time but i think particularly you know, in the last couple of years it's really been evident is just that we don't have as much control as we thought we don't have as much ability to reshape the world in our image and i think that's confronting for a lot of people um mm -hmm. you know uh there is a, a billboard i just saw just near my house huh. um last night of a private girls school and it has, you know, this big line, and it's girl unstoppable, you know, and look, that's good. They're trying to, you know, like get people to come to their school and promote a really good message for young women who can move into leadership in the world. But there's an element to that. We are stoppable. You know, we're mortal creatures and we have limitations. We have a particular period of time we'll live in this world. And what we're discovering is that things like pandemics, economics, geopolitical things, cultural conflict, all of this does have an effect upon us. And so I think there's almost this crisis that people are being thrown into where some of the ideology of our day isn't aligning with our lived reality. And you get a break then. That, that's like a cultural crisis because the myths and narratives that we've been told start to fall down. And maybe they're not, I don't think they've fully fallen down yet. They're still there. Um, and where we're at, I think at the moment is now it's almost two messages. There's one message like you're powerful, you're unstoppable, you've got the truth inside of you. But then it's also like you're fragile you're in danger, but you know, there's, there's problems here. And those two messages are like sort of short circuiting each other. And I think we're, we're feeling that in a, in a lived way. Okay. So if, if those two messages are short circuiting each other, like you just said, do you think that is catalyzing some of the neurosis, some of the anxiety, um, the, some of the, the behaviors towards just being insular that we're seeing in culture today? What do you think? Yeah. So I think there's, I think you, pointed out two things going on there. I think I think one, that insularity. I yeah. remember there was a, a marketer called Faith Popcorn. She may still be around. And she read a book that I read like 15, 20 years ago. I was around when 9-11 happened. And, and she, yeah. she predicted that cocooning, she called it cocooning would occur. And she linked in the book, which was fascinating, the, the rise of big screen TVs had been around for some time, but actually hadn't really cut through in the market um, because people were like, I don't need it giant TV, but actually there was a link between 9-11 and the aftermath of that and people then finally going mainstream with big screen TVs. And part of that was, I don't want to go to public spaces. I want to go into my house retreat. And, um, you know, I think we've seen a continuation of that, um, but I think it's become more intense. And I think particularly technology, um, but almost this message that the world is increasingly becoming a scary place. Like I'm, I'm hearing more people saying, I don't, I don't watch the news anymore. I can't, I can't handle what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. one trend is the insularity. I think the second thing is that, yeah, when, when you have built your life 
around certain stories that the dominant culture has told you and they're not working. It creates a neurosis in the culture and we naturally imbibe that neurosis. Uh, and you know, I think that if you go back and look, I think over the last 15, 20 years, there's been a message where it's almost, if something's wrong in the world, the world's a, a good place and it's sliding towards being a better place. So if there's something wrong, it's more something wrong with you. Now that's true sometimes, um, but I think what's happening is the world is not sliding to necessarily a better place. I think we all intuitively feel that. Um, you keep hearing these unexpected things. I think we're just sharing, uh, you know, as we were before we came on air, you know, like here in Melbourne, as I'm recording, it's one of the coldest mornings, you know, at, in, in ages, you know. And so I'm sitting here going, ah, oh, Melbourne, which people think Australia is warm, you know, and we do have some cold snaps, but we've got record yeah. cold winter. And we've got friends in the UK who I just was looking online who are like, it's the hottest day today, I think, in UK history. Um, you know, so you're seeing these continual... <coughs> unexpected, you know, record shattering things, you know, we keep seeing the unexpected. And I think part of that language around the unexpected is we thought the world would get to this better place, but it's not. So therefore, we're like now going, hang on, there's a problem with the world. And there's a problem with us as well. And we don't have a way of dealing with that. So I think you're right, that comes out in these neuroses that we're seeing anxiety, mm. um, depression. Um, mm. and, and there's always been mental health conditions that people people live with. And we, when we look across cultures, we see that there's a certain cohort in every culture and different nationalities and stuff that that happens, whether it's in Tonga or Taiwan or Switzerland. But what we're actually seeing is that's growing and it's going beyond that cohort. So there's a cultural thing happening at play. Mm. Okay, so considering the focus of this podcast, which is around mental health and emotional health and spiritual growth, Mark, I'd love to put language around... Um, part of what we talked about, but what many people joined with us have been experiencing, but where they may have lacked the clarity to put words around their experience. These are what I believe you talked about in your book, Gray Zones, mm. which I find so yes. fascinating. Mm. Can you paint a, an almost prophetic picture of what mm. many have felt, what many are experiencing today, and then how to gain some clarity mm. around it all? You know, like What do we need to know that we might mm. not be able to discern? Mm. Great question. So I don't know if you've ever had the experience or listeners have had the experience of going to another country where perhaps you don't speak the language, the signage is in a different language. You get off a, a plane, it's maybe late at night, you've got to get to a hotel. I remember getting off a plane and having to get across Tokyo, which is just epically huge, you know, and get to this desk and get on that bus. I don't speak the language. The signage is different. The city's unfamiliar. And you're doing a simple thing, but it's so complex and you feel stressed. And finally, when you get to your hotel or wherever you're staying, you just, you know, like it was like you've gone on a, you know, a medieval ordeal or something, you know, just to get there. Um, and there's some people enjoy that. But, like you know, for someone like me, I find it stressful because it's different to catching the bus across town in my city. Now, if I did that in the United States, I speak the language. I've been to the United States many times. I'm much more familiar. So it's not my culture, but I'm more familiar. But so what that tells us is there are certain cultural markers and certain things that we look for that actually provide us with a sense of mental well-being because we know where the boundaries lie. We know where to go. There are indicators. There's clarity around, you know, what, what, we're, what we, you know, to help us flourish in our every day. It's like if you've got a good routine, your mind can go on to a kind of autopilot. Yes. So, you know, yeah, it's like every morning I go for a walk. I did it this morning despite it being so cold. Last week I had a bad cold as in I was sick for a week. And it's funny, like my body was like, because I, so I didn't go for my walk, but I felt out of sorts because my usual thing for I've done for years now, go for a big walk in the morning, get the blood pumping. So your brain's like slightly short circuited. So we have all these programs that we're running on autopilot, just sort of downloading the background, you know, your breakfast or whatever. Um you know, you're going to eat it. You don't have to think too much about it. Um, <clears throat> but then you wake up one morning, you haven't got bread, you haven't got cereal, whatever you do. And your brain's like, oh man, I got to think about this. What's happening culturally is we've come to the end of, I think, a 30 year period where it's like all of the markers have been there. We understand how things work. Uh, and in a sense, there was a culture that we assumed just like, you know, catching the bus from the airport in my city, I don't think much about it. 
doing that in Tokyo, I have to really think about it because there's different markets. So we've moved from something familiar and we're moving into something unfamiliar. That's what's happened in the world. And we've seen this in all different indications, political um, you know, elections that end up different than anyone predicted. Inflation at the moment, you know, there was like, it was going to be transitory. It's staying longer. They told us that inflation was over, was a lot of economists were saying not that long ago. You know, we didn't expect, um, you know, Russia to invade Ukraine. There's just all these things in the world where you were told this is what the world's going to be like. And now it's not. And you get this sense and very few are wanting to sort of say it that we're actually entering into a new phase. But the problem with a new phase is they don't just appear overnight, that it's not like the medieval period ended on a Tuesday at 5 p.m., you know, and then you know, I don't know, the Renaissance kicked off at six o'clock. There's always this this overlap yes. between the two. And and I think that's where we're at now. So in a sense, like part, when I was going to write the book, I almost wanted to go, oh, here's the new era. This is what it is. Here's all the markers. This is what it look like. Prepare yourself. Now, if it was that simple, in some ways that would allay, whilst we might fear change, which everyone does a bit, we could go, okay, so I'm going from here to here. But where we're going, we don't know. And we're in the in between what I call a gray zone. So it's it's like it's not black, it's not white, it's gray, it's in between. And so there's there's things which trick us. Like, you know, I went to didn't travel for two and a half years with the pandemic, but then went to London, um, city I've been many times like a few weeks ago, and got there. And it was just this weird experience where I'm like, this is familiar. But then some things have changed. Like, oh, it's great to be back here. There's that place. Oh, those buildings, that's not there anymore. Or getting on the tube, which is normally packed in like sardines at 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning and going, I've got an empty carriage now. Oh, people aren't coming into the city. So it was familiar, but unfamiliar. Then I went to New Zealand, another city, another country I know really well, traveled to many times. And same thing. It was like, oh, you know, oh, good old New Zealand. Really, it's a very close country to Australia. Oh, it's the same, but hang on, this is a bit different now. That, that's changed. This is weird. So it's this familiar, unfamiliar thing all the time. And that's incredibly challenging when mm. you don't have the market. So in a sense, we're all now gotten off the plane with jet lag in Tokyo airport and got to get across the city and we don't speak the language. That's a felt thing that we're all experiencing. You know, so yeah. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> that's so helpful. And, and just to sort of reflect what I heard you say is this, if I could just put different language around it. Okay, we've all experienced a measure of shaking. Folks, right yes. now you're listening and you're saying, yes, I have been shaken in my finances, my relationships, my mental and emotional health, mm -hmm. uh, my faith walk, whatever that may be. We've all experienced and are experiencing shaking. Now, yes. shaking, gray zone, after gray zone awakening. And you even cite Randall Schweller, who I find fascinating in your mm. book. He said that the world is undergoing transformation right now. And mm. as I just said, I believe prophetically, everything that can be shaken is being shaken so that the only unshakable thing will stand. And not to be pithy, but like I said, I believe shaking mark is for awakening. So walk mm. us through, if you would, mindset shifts, some principles. Mm. Mm. Uh, to navigate shaking this instability, mm. even through mm. your experience of getting on the tube in the UK and you're like, wait a mm. minute, this is familiar, but so unfamiliar. Mm. How do we, how do we reorient and re-index our mental maps in this mm. space mm. with maturity and with stability? Mm. I, I realized, um, I think particularly the pandemic at the beginning was the thing which made me realize this, that. I had assumed there's these challenges that I'm going to face as I do stuff. So I'm trying to flourish in my life. I'm trying to flourish. Yeah. You know, I'm, a, I'm a church minister. I'm trying to flourish in that, grow my church, yeah. my family, my life. Then, then all of a sudden, you know, the, oh, sorry, the way that I thought about that was that's there. I want to find these spaces of rest or find these spaces where I can sort of pull back and think about that and rejuvenate and then have enough space and, and, and feel good to then go back and uh -huh. go deal with those challenges. Then all of a sudden, you know, the pandemic hits and, you know, all around the world, everything's changes very quickly. And, you know, I realized that the challenge wasn't actually far. And we had a very long lockdown here in Melbourne and the challenge wasn't those things. It was now just, like life, <laughs> you know, the most basic things mm -hmm. 
that um, you know I took for granted, I could not take for granted anymore. And I began to realize that I had made this assumption that the environment that I was living in would always be fairly stable. I wouldn't be challenged by it too much. And I wanted to find this safe place, this comfort zone in the midst of that, you know, my just environment to then go and deal with these challenges. But all of a sudden, everything became a challenge. So I had to rethink all this. And I think that many people feel like that, that almost part of the, if you ever think of a, a, a really, um, there's, there's a mall near here, they've redone it. It's really nice. You go in there and, you know, everything in that place is designed to make you feel a certain way. Uh, there's a guy on my team who used to be do big building projects and he talked about malls and he talked about the fact that they even they even like track how far you walk and then they'll put like a water feature or something to almost refresh you. You know, so the whole thing is the music, the imagery, how you're walking, the art is to make you feel good to, to, to spend in this mall. But I think that's almost been like our world. Our world has been to make you feel good to then help you do the stuff you want to do. Um or they or others want you to do and and you know i realized that actually what's happened is we're just in crisis all the time so it made me rethink crisis and in in reading scripture in looking i think at, you know particularly how god works through people i began to realize that actually what happens is is that crisis is the seedbed of opportunity that god puts us in that when crisis comes that's weirdly this thing where you said there's a prophetic shaking of everything and all of a sudden you can't put your trust in things that may have almost been idols that you didn't realize it. Like I realized there's obvious idols that I was not aiming for and like, cause I, they're obviously bad to me. Okay. That's, that's not, you know, I don't want to just have unadulterated power or, you know, like whatever, you know, you know, there's bad stuff to stay away from. But then I realized that I'd made things in my life and I think we all have, um, almost like idols that that aren't touched and i think look at the world now it's incredible politics shaken uh you know economics shaken um every sort of public figure that like who is an untouched public figure now even you know e everyone yeah. is undermined so uh yeah. we're seeing governments fall leaders fall uh we're even seeing things like netflix you know which was like this new breakthrough startup company which became huge and a year ago they seemed insurmountable as this top of the, the but now people are talking about, oh, is, is, you know, they're in debt, you know, what's, what does this all mean? So even the latest new guys on the block are being shaken. And, you know, the internet's gone from something which was this hopeful thing to now this thing which is being shaken. And, you know, you look forward and you go, I don't know what in three years time things look like. Uh, so <clears throat> part of my sense is, when all of those things are shaken, you are brought back to this catalytic moment where you have to realize that, that I think God uses crisis to, tra to, tra to change us and to change human systems because in that we turn to him. And so that's been the reframing for me that, that I now, I don't, I don't say I enjoy crisis at all, but I, I recognize there's something holy in the midst of crisis that God uses to to move things forward towards his purposes what are the some of the things that we can do should do maybe some of the things that you do in this position to reframe reorient and then to even just live out monday tuesday wednesday i'll give you an example and i'll spring off of what you said okay if crisis is the seedbed i think of hosea chapter 10 verse 12 Break up your fallow ground, he says. Prepare yourself. Seek the Lord that he may rain righteousness upon you. Okay. So, Mark, it's Monday morning. Everything around you is being shaken. You are having to reorient yourself in very simple ways of doing everyday life. What are some of the practical things that you do in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening that you would encourage all of us to do so that Number one, we allow the shaking to happen so that our hearts can be prepared to receive the seed that the Lord is wanting to sow. And number two, so that we can become flexible, malleable, and, and be people who are flowing with what he's doing. What do you do? Great question. A number of years ago, I was reading a biography of William Wilberforce um, by the British um, uh, uh his historian used to be in parliament. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's William Hague, uh, and yeah, William Hague. And um, 
there was a bit in that where, you know, Wilberforce is, you know, in Parliament, tremendous political pressure. He was an independent. It was at this time a tremendous shaking. Britain, you know, had been at war. The culture was shaking. The world was turning modern. People were moving from the countryside to cities. Uh, terrible poverty. The cities like like London was just a nightmare in terms of, you know, law and order and poverty and, and alcohol. It were just terrible times, really. But in the midst, he's on this, God's got him on this lifelong project, um, you know, really to bring sort of God's way into, into the political sphere. And, you know, the sort of height of that is, you know, when he is involved in the sort of, um, you know, elimination of slavery um, within the British Empire. And there's this one bit, though, in the midst of which, which caught me, because that's the big picture thing, you know, like that's the big change he's, he's, he wants to be part of. It's the big, you know, matter stuff that's happening in the world. But there's one bit which captured me in the biography where he goes to dinner with some uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of patrons or wealthier people or something, and they put on this huge spread. And he goes home and he has this diary, uh, like a schedule diary thing, and he marks down the fact that he thought he, I think he thought he ate a bit too much food. And so he literally had this, this, this sort of spreadsheet which would mark what he did in every day. And then he was doing that so that he wouldn't be almost seduced by these people coming, offering him all this food, trying to almost win him over. And he was like, I have to guard my heart. So I'm going to go that I don't just become this guy's going this thing, getting like overfed and, and whatever. Now, I was fascinated by that. And what I discovered was that if you look at a lot of the key leaders at that time, people like John and Charles Wesley, um, George Whitfield, so many of them did this. They had like this daily record of what they did and they were marking. So we've got these actual incredible um, like historical records. They know like I think George Whitfield at like Tuesday at five o'clock read this particular book and the Holy Spirit warmed his heart because he literally marked and logged it all. Now, what I realized is that's something that I took, took up. I'm, I wasn't a <coughs> super organized person. But I, I realized there's something there where you almost have to be proactive to take control of your day for God. And because there's so much stuff in our world coming at us and the, the way that the world is constantly trying to get us to react and get our attention, you almost need to mark your day with a holy intent. And the process of them doing that, um, you know, I mean, so I literally have like, you know, a book, it's like a habit tracker I just got on Amazon, you know, for like $9 or something, you know, and I'll ask questions, you know, did I pray today? Did I read that chapter from that book I wanted to read? Um, and I, I wanted to mark this. You've got to be careful here. There is a slight danger. I realized that when you set these things, that they become the front of the bow of the ship um, instead of like an aid. God needs to be the front of the bow of the ship. And there is a slight danger in Catholic times that you can almost get a bit sort of religious about this and sort of do that as a way of, I can't control the world, but I can control myself. I see it differently. I see this as how do I intentionally, prayerfully set out my day so that the world doesn't win my day, but the Holy Spirit is present through my day. And this is actually an earlier thing, like, I, I, you know, even the there was the prayer of examine where people would, here's my day, God, here's my time. It's an offering to you. How did I use it? Now, I think what's different to us than the 18th century when, when Wilberforce and others were doing this is we've all had it where you, you sit there and you just go, I just watch half an hour of TV. And the next thing you know, you fought through three episodes of an hour long series on Netflix, or you sit down for five minutes with your phone and like, Oh my goodness, where did that two hours go? So I think there's an intentionality that, that we need to now go, it's not that the world's going to furnish us this comfortable place to sit. Stuff's going to come at us. Like, but we need to be intentional on, on allowing the Holy Spirit to form us and offering our time up to God as one of the resources. You know, and I think of Romans 12, you know, it's like this is the offering of our bodies as living sacrifices. Um, you know, and it's the renewal of our mind. Um, so that that's one thing that I've done. Oh. And, you know, I, I had I had covid I had COVID in London. I mentioned you know, I was in London. I got COVID in that trip, came back. My daughter got COVID. Then I got something else sick. Now, at those moments, my daily thing went out the window, right? <laughs> and, and 
I just felt God saying to me like a week ago, get back on it. Like, like, yeah, just get back on this reset. So there's times I mess it up. So I don't want to be like, I'm this robot machine guy who's just banging this out all the time. Um, but I just recognize there's that, that moments where I need to, to let in the midst of all this chaos, have a holy intent is the word and, and a mechanism for doing that. I, I love that and so appreciate what you said, Mark, because a lot of the conversations I've been a part of as of late, both with guys like John Mark or John Tyson or whomever, we're all being formed, whether we mm. like it or not, because formation isn't a Christian thing. It's a human thing. The question is who and what is forming us. So what I hear you saying is, and I'll just use a, a John Mark term, it's a rule mm. of life. And you're saying... Yes. I'm going to calibrate the affections of my heart intentionally so that the traumas of the world don't hook my attention before I fill my mind, my heart with truth. Is that what I heard you say? Yes, yes. And I, and I add a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. it, would always, it always needs to be in conversation with what's happening in the environment because so uh, this is something more. that yeah. we... Yeah, we're big into this, I think, you know, in our church. But one thing I did know is when the pandemic first happened and people all of a sudden couldn't go to work, they couldn't, you know, walk the usual route they would do and pray or they had homeschooling or all of this. There were people who really struggled. And I was saying to guys, like, you need to be adaptive to the environment. So the practices, again, it's not the bow of the ship breaking through the ice. It's... Um, is it the bow of the stern, the front bed of the ship, whatever it is, breaking through the ice, it needs to be adaptive to the environment. So practice it. So there's a principle here. The principle is giving your time with holy intent to God. The practice then is the secondary thing. So at the moment for me, that looks like, uh, you know, doing this sort of daily examine type thing. Now, just an example. I, I love having quiet time with God. In the morning, I read scriptures, I pray, I get up, I have this routine, I have my coffee ready to go, I sit in the same place. Now, when when uh, my wife became pregnant with twins and twins turned up in our lives and we went from having eight hours sleep a night to one and a half hours of sleep broken, uh, that did not look like that. Like, to be completely honest, my practice at that time at some point was literally going into, I also had a three-year-old daughter at the time, was literally going into the bathroom, trying to read the Bible in my phone, almost barricading the door while my daughter's banging on the door. And I'm like, if I can read one verse and focus on this for two minutes. Now, what that was, was I, I had to adapt because my environment had changed. The principle was though, God, I'm going to still read the scriptures. Now, it may not be a chapter where I sit and I, I reflect. It, I'm just going to read this. One other thing, me and my wife, when we when we had twins leading a church, it was a military operation to get us to church with with twin twin babies. And <laughs> often we would arrive at church as the service was starting and leave church. It was ending. Often I don't remember much, even though I was you know, leading the church. My wife barely had any enjoyment around church at that period. But we made this decision that we were going to keep the habit of church as a witness for our, our people and also for us and for our kids. So that was an adaption of the principle was, you know, don't neglect meeting together because <laughs> we form in community. Um, it looked different than what church is now. We know we're often there's still an hour afterwards talking to people. And, you know, so principle then practice. People get it wrong when the, prince, the practice becomes the principle and then the environment changes. Okay, so let's connect this to what you said earlier because I think that's so helpful, especially for driven, type A, Enneagram 1s like mm. me. <laughs> you know, I love routine, and, and I know many of my friends hanging out with us today um, have systems and habits and routines, but we have to learn how to be malleable with the seasons of life as they shift, right? That's what I heard yes. you say. So yes. good, right? Yeah. Because fruitfulness is... Fruitfulness might look different in different seasons of life, but it does not discount the fact that it is still fruitfulness, right? Yes. I mean, just to give mm. you a quick example, I remember when the pandemic first hit and we could we had, we had could only go out in Melbourne, we can only go out sort of like for a certain period of the day. And I bumped yeah, into yeah. some, we've been talking at church just before this, a lot about Sabbath and so on and, and you know, routine, take time with God. And I was going for my walk and I bumped into um, a guy from my church, small business owner, pandemic just hit 
you know, he's got some guys who are in his, he's employed and he just said, Mark, what do I do? I can't do the practices that I did before. I can't take this whole day off. I'm, I'm working now multiple days a week to save my business, to keep these people working. And I realized at that moment, he almost needed freeing from the burden. <laughs> you know, like I think the holiest thing he could do in this emergency type situation of a global pandemic was, yep, yeah, keep working. You're doing the right thing. Um, like there was no way he could, you know, if he took that day, people are going to lose their jobs and that's not forever. But I feel that there's sometimes people almost need to be freed from it as well. You know, I love reading. I I, I read heaps. It's a big discipline. There was an old, um, uh, you know, one of my old sort of bosses, she said to me one day, Mark, I'm going to challenge you not to read for six months. And I was like, wow. And she goes, just so it doesn't become an idol. And I was like, oh man, and I did that. And she's like, I'm just going to free you from having to read all this stuff, information for six months, try it. It was hugely changing for me. Now I went back to reading at the end of that six months and it was brilliant, but I almost had to just for a period disconnect from that so that the practice didn't become the idol. So I think Mm -hmm. Tertullian said, we're always, I mean, it's supposed to, yeah. He said the, the, the gospel is always caught between, just as Jesus was between two sinners on the cross, the gospel is always between irreligion where we just run away from any rule and do what the heck we want and then religiosity. And it's always this, this balance, this paradox, you know, and I think maybe, as you mentioned, people who, you know, like maybe, maybe me as well, <laughs> like <laughs> good routines and structures, yeah. you know, I realized that I'm often, I don't want to be the irreligious person. So, you know, like, but maybe that's never going to be the temptation for me. Maybe the temptation is I become the religious Pharisee who's like, doing it in this particular way. So I think that's what I always try and say to people in seasons where, you know, the environment changes, maybe revisit your practices with your founding principles of why you're doing this. Yeah, that's so good. Okay. So this may be a different side of the same coin Mm. because, um, we've been talking all about adaptation, et cetera. Um, Mark, you wrote that confusion is dominant during transitional moments of rapid change. You want to unpack that a little bit for us because that connects to even some of this anxiety that I think many are are dealing with. Yeah. I think that when culture is going through a change and those markers and indicators are are not operating like they usually do in a a more stable time, um, it it creates a tremendous amount of confusion and there's an element where confusion is a mental process, and uh, but also there's almost this panicked side of confusion that happens. Um, there's this like phenomenon, a social phenomenon, I would call it, where there's almost something irrational and infectious around confusion. So, for example, if if you had to get out of a building really quickly, and say there was a fire. Um, now you can walk, right? Just say you were by yourself and you're walking and there's some maps, you know, the back of hotels that go like, if in fire is go this way. You'll look at those maps. Okay, where do I go? Now, if they were taken away for some reason and you're trying to find your way out of that building, you might get confused, but you're sort of still trying to battle between your panic and your rational brain. Now, if you had 30 people with you on that, on that journey, and 10 of them are starting are crying, another 10 are getting angry, and another 10 are freaking out, that process of confusion almost becomes overwhelming because there's a social dynamic to it. And what I realized with confusion and with anxiety, I think the thing that we've forgotten is that there's, there's almost irrational dynamics to it. So for example, if you um, see, you know, here's, here's an example. So we, we, we're in the midst of winter here. We've got a flu wave. We've got a COVID wave. Um, and yes, two nights ago, they basically put out this thing where they said, we're not going to mandate masks for school, but we're going to recommend strongly that you wear them. The education department said that. So <clears throat> I just was walking, as I said this morning, and I was walking, seeing that the newspapers that people had delivered to the front of houses, there's the more right-wing newspaper was like, mask furor you know, backlash against masks. And then the more left-wing paper was like, you know, people encouraged to wear masks. And like, I just was walking along going, this is, this is quite fascinating social like (laughs) observation. Yeah. There's confusion, you know, like, and it's, and people will in different houses, depending on what newspaper they read (coughs) 
and what their sort of bent is, that they will pick that up. And it's it's more than just a rational decision. There's all these emotions. And that's just one example of stuff happening in the world. There, there's emotions everywhere. Um, and, you know, I, I realized that when you're online, when you're talking to people, our media, all of it is this giant feedback loop. It's a system at the moment making us confused. And because people don't necessarily have an answer um, and you hear differing points. So confusion is something which often we've thought is an individual mental uh, cognitive thing because we don't have the right information. But there's a point when there's too much information that you become, you know, like if, 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 if you had to buy a house or, you know, yourself and you wanted to know the legal processes and I gave you just, the, there's those books, The Dummy's Guide to Real Estate. If I just gave you The Dummy's Guide, you would feel less confused than if I gave you 700 legal texts about real estate law. If you, you know, you say so you'd have better information, more information, but this point where I can't read all this, differing legal opinions, so, so there's a sense where confusion at this point in time is something we're all going to have to navigate. And what's not going to happen is this is not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. Um, so we, we need to learn how to actually learn to step back from some of this. And this is where I think the scriptures come in. I, th I think the scriptures come in and the scriptures talk about things like wisdom, discernment. The scriptures are God's revelation. These things are always worth something to the people of God. They're, they're hugely important. But at this time, I think they become hugely important because of the cultural confusion, this gray zone moment we're in. So I think understanding everything, yes, it's still important to do that. But I think now these spiritual resources to, to live our lives and flourish and follow God become more important of discernment, wisdom, God's revelation. Okay, so then if anxiety, confusion, if all of that is just going to get more full on, what does it mean? What does it take to become a non-anxious presence in this world? And we'll get to talking about um, how influence is catalyzed through that. But I just want to hear your heart because this is the title of the book. This is a huge passion point for you, Mark. What does it mean and what does it take to become a non-anxious presence in this anxious world? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I, 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 like probably everyone, just began to become really aware of the anxious tone everywhere. And it's like if someone's been turning up the temperature slowly on a heating system, you know. So it wasn't like it didn't happen in 2017 and it was, it's been slowly turning up for years. Probably I began to be aware of this and, you know, I would go online and, You'd hear people worrying about the future of the church, worrying about the culture, worrying about everything, both left and right. Everyone's worrying. Everyone's anxious. Like there's no one, there's no fact. Where is the calm faction in the world? There's not one. You know, if you look at the culture. I remember having a cup of tea with an older leader in my city who was in ministry for many years. And he invited me over. And this, this couple, I think maybe in their 70s or even early 80s. And, and I went over and I had this cup of tea. And what struck me immediately was their presence. <laughs> and super calm, really, still really sharp, asking about culture, super calm. And even there was something about sitting down and having this cup of tea that, you know, they boiled it and they had a pot. And it was almost this ritual. And I'm just sitting at this table and I just found myself slowing down <laughs> and I thought there's something here and and it made me think of when I was really young I'd meet these older Christians and there was just something different about them there was like a spiritual thing which emerged from them they weren't set by the world God had done something in their lives and I began to think hey, there's got to be a different way um, and then I read a book by uh, a family therapist rabbi Edwin Friedman and and he talked about this concept that Leadership actually doesn't come from necessary charisma, achievement, positional power, that really what leadership comes from is actually what he called a non-anxious presence, that human systems inherently turn anxious, confused, um, you know, without vision, the people perish, the scriptures say, and I you know, could add that another way, without vision, the people get anxious um, and look left and right, who's going to lead us? And... You know, I began to realize that, hang on, 
what the world's missing, and I think what many leaders are missing, is this new posture. And that's what Friedman really sort of helped me understand. And, you know, I began to try and look at that in my own leadership. You know, there's bits where I felt anxious and I realized I would actually get in an anxious feedback loop with A, the world. So you read an article, yeah. this is happening. Oh, I'm anxious. Yeah. Like I read the news. Something When I was younger, my dad would buy the newspaper and I would read it often over my breakfast. I didn't put the paper down feeling anxious. I often put the paper down feeling more informed about the world and then went on with my day. And I wouldn't interact with the news until if I watched the news that night, it was, you know, but now it's this constant thing coming out. It's making us anxious. I also realized leading that I'm leading people who feel anxious and often my anxiety would bounce off their anxiety. And we'd almost be in this codependent feedback loop of anxiety. You see that in families that, you know, mm -hmm. if my wife's worried about something, then I'm worried and my kids reacting and I'm reacting and all of a sudden everyone's at this, this super emotional tense point. So this was just a, a, a concept that, cut through for me. But then I think as I looked at the scriptures, again, particularly in the life of Jesus, you just see so many times he has emotion. So he's not like a robot. You know, you think of him you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's absolute incredible emotion there. But then there's still this non-anxious presence when there's a storm uh, you know, on the lake and the disciples are freaking out and he's just resting. And his non-anxious presence basically is because he's defeated the evil and the powers in the world. You know, he is above the, the storms. And I remember thinking there's something in that. And, and it just has been a growing conviction for me that the posture that, that the church, that leaders, that individual believers, I think any, any leader needs to take in the world is one to be a non-anxious presence. And Friedman talked about it like a, a kind of white blood cell that brings healing to an infected system mm -hmm. is just a really mm -hmm. cool metaphor that I like. Mm -hmm. Have we been in an anxious feedback loop for so long that we don't even realize it for what it is? We just think it's Tuesday and it's anything but normal. Yes. What do you think? Uh, I agree. You know, I, I remember going to the real, one of the smallest countries in the world is the Cook Islands. I think it's only about 10,000 people. I went there and it's a small island and you catch a bus around. It takes you half an hour to go around the whole island. And I got on the bus. It was like, I think it's two, like 30 people bus <laughs> you know, to go around the island. And I saw this one guy and he just was sitting there and I saw him. And then, you know, we went off and we had this lunch and we came back three hours later and he just was still sitting there just reflecting, you know, and when I was in the Cook Islands, it was just fascinating just seeing people just sitting and reflecting. And you see that in parts of the world, people just sit in city squares and talk and reflect. And mm -hmm. um, it's a totally different pace. This, this thing that, that we're in, I think what happened is it's become monetized. One, one people, just, uh, at some point, people were struggling to make money from the internet. And what they realized is like, I studied advertising and, and, you know, this was pre-internet when I studied advertising and, you know, they tried to use certain things like sex and power to get people to buy stuff. So in a sense, if you had an ad which gave people a sense of personal power, you had some sort of often sexual imagery around that, that was, you know, often what sold. But what they found online was what is goes viral online is negative feelings. Um, people will click on an article and click on that news article to even argue against it. You know, they call it hate clicking. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, if I, if I went, I know without a doubt that if I today after this pick leader A and went on a YouTube rant and yelled at them for 10 minutes and then I put that up, that's going to go viral far more than if I gave a reflective thought about something and talked about it. if i said here's some thoughts on prayer versus if i was like this is the leader so and so he's sold out it would be mark says is losing his brain blah blah what's going on it would just go a hundred thousand times further yeah. than if i did something reflective so negative emotions um spread i remember talking to a, a pastor at a very large church and he talked about the fact that in in a couple week period they had this incredible conversion where like 15 people came to faith out of his couple of families, amazing story. At the same time, someone had a moral failure in the church. And 
they had to have almost a campaign where they're like, let's do a video of this great testimony of these people coming to faith. Let's promote it because the story didn't travel socially. He said he realized within about seven minutes of that moral failure with that leader happening, probably a few thousand people had heard about it because bad news travels fast. So that's what I think has been monetized as part of our world. Um, if all of a sudden, if inflation goes away tomorrow, politics completely calms down, uh, society start getting run really well, Putin leaves Ukraine and decides to be really normal, we come up with some solutions for the environment, what, what, people are going to lose their jobs in the media because there's not, going to be nothing to report. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. So that's it. So like. You know, like, so there's an element that this people are all adding to the fuel on the fire because it's the only way they can get eyeballs on stuff at the moment. So I think you're right. This is the air we breathe. It's not always been like this for humans. Let's actually try a different way. Okay, then I want to go right to your words. You said this, quote, we must differentiate between the individual mental health challenge of anxiety, which a minority of individuals in every culture experience and the systemic anxiety that our contemporary culture structures create. Teach that out however you feel is helpful for us, especially yeah. in this context. I, I just think there's a huge key for us in this, Mark. I think that one of the things that we struggle with as, as a culture at the moment is with our vocabulary and our descriptors of the intensity of something. So, for example... Um, mental health, I think, is one of these words. So there is an increasing and much needed conversation around mental health. Um, there are many people who have struggled for years and years without mental health. I was listening to a podcast yesterday of, of a news thing and they were reporting on uh, ADHD. And a guy rang up and he just said his son was diagnosed with ADHD and they said to him, um, it's genetic. So you've probably got it. And this man, I think in his maybe 60s, was diagnosed very late with attention deficit disorder. And he just said, my life was terrible. If I'd known this when I was younger, my life would have turned out completely different. So two things are happening at once. We're having a, an understanding medically of the, you know, the importance of our brains and our bodies and, and how we have uh, mental health disorders. And so anything from depression to bipolarity to attention deficit disorders, schizophrenia, there are these things that we're learning more about. So that's happening at this stage. There's another conversation where uh, there is a cultural dynamic happening, which is also affecting our mental health. Now, I think one of the problems at the moment is, um, I remember when the pandemic first happened, and people were talking about this is going to affect the mental health of lots of people. There's an element like, yes, yeah, so it's going to affect particularly those who are struggling from mental health conditions. Is it going to affect them? Yes. Can even mental health conditions, um, you know, be worsened or even appear in people because of the pressure of that? Yes. But there's also an element that when you go back in time and you look, say, at the, the Blitz in, in London when it was bombed, that would have affected the mental health of people. There's an element where almost I think we believe this thing that that to feel good in your mind all the time, regardless of what is happening outside, is the normal state of affairs. Most people through history, the, the last 30 years we have lived through have been historically the most, the most prosperous, the most peaceful. Uh, it, it's been so abnormal in the history of humanity. You know, a lot of people are like, is this the end of the world? And who knows, you know, like when Jesus returns, I don't know. But if you look at, you know, like often I say to people, you know, who go, this is crazy. This is unprecedented times. Like, have you read about the 1930s? <laughs> when have you read about the 18th century? Have you read about the yeah. 14th century? Have you read about the 7th seventh, seventh century? You know, like, like history is filled with pandemics, wars, social unrest, famines. Like that's normal. Most humans throughout history have not had an expectation that they're not going to encounter difficulty. Somehow, we need to rest apart the fact that we're discovering about mental health, but then also the fact that humans, because of what we experience, we live in a broken, sinful world, are going to have periods where what we experience is really difficult mentally. Um, 
And I feel like there's no differentiation between those two things. So there's an element of what I'm saying here is there are people listening. Now, for, for me, my skin in the game of this is at 30, I was diagnosed with bipolarity. Now, that was something that was a medical diagnosis that I have. So I have that and I have to manage that. And that's a part of my life. However, there's also this other thing that I recognize when there's stuff happening in the culture that affects me in this particular way. And I had bought some of the sort of mythology that you're always going to feel good. And there's a culture dynamic happening at the same time. If you look, so Gene Twenge wrote a book about the iPhone. And in that yes. book, or the effect of the iPhone, that if you look at the the health and well-being and mental health of young people, it radically changes when the iPhone comes in. It's like the charts are almost comical. They're so obvious that this has had an effect. Um, that, you know, I think it's um, Hallowell, I think the expert on ADHD is talking about there's now cultural ADHD because we're on, we're on screens all the time, you know. Um, so... I believe that those who have a mental health challenge need to need to manage that. And and I hope my life is a, a testimony that um, you can have a mental health diagnosis and still live a full life for God. And, 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 you know, I try and live that. But then there's also an element that there is a cultural dynamic that we need to differentiate because there's almost a virus in the culture that is emotional and mental around fear, anxiety, negativity. And, and yeah, that's, that's the sense of differentiation I think I'm trying to get there. And I, I really want to make that very mm. clear because it can be misunderstood what I'm saying there, but I, hopefully I've made it clear. No, I think you have, and, and super helpful to this, Mark. I think in, in our uh, closing moments here, um, I think it would be helpful to create perhaps an off-ramp to what we've talked about today is I'd love for you to unpack strongholds because if we're talking about this mm. virus or perhaps even a linchpin to this issue, I think in part it's strongholds. So if mm. we talk about tearing down strongholds, and I think about a scripture like 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, uh, 4 and 5, Talk to us about what a stronghold is, how it shows up in our lives, and really what to do about them. And then I'll, I'll follow up with another question. Mm. Well, strongholds is one of those sort of terms that often we can use in the Christian world, part of our Christianese. Um, and it, it's, but often it's not examined, but I think it's actually so helpful. And if you go back to the origins of the term, a stronghold is like a fortress, or it could even be a natural. Um, mountain that that provides protection for people you know who who need protection and you look at a lot of this language you know you look in the psalms and david's language he's looking for a stronghold and if you think about what's going on with david at that time david is on the run from you know saul and yeah. he also has a there's also a later a later rebellion by absalom and he's looking i don't have the protection of the capital city i don't have my fort. I don't have my castle. So I'm looking for strongholds. And I think today when we think about nature, we think about, you know, vast expanses and it's so beautiful, but that's a modern way of looking at it. That in the ancient world, there's no GPS, there's no rescue helicopter going to come and get you. There's bandits, there's wild animals, there's dangerous terrain and dangerous weather. And to actually be in the wilderness was a really dangerous place. So you did not want to be in the wilderness. You wanted to find a stronghold to protect you. And so there's always this narrative a drama in scripture where is god going to be your stronghold or is something in the world going to be your stronghold you know a natural a natural fortress a, a mountain range or are you going to look to god or you know david goes and hangs out with a, a foreign king to get protection you know and what i realized is that because as humans i think our, our fallenness our disconnection from god we're anxious if you look at you know, Cain, it says in scriptures, he's always wandering east of Eden. You know, there's this anxiousness. He almost builds a city out of this anxiety for his son to have this name. And so humans, I think, in our fallen state are naturally anxious because we're disconnected from the true source of peace, Christ's presence. And so <clears throat> when we face this temptation, and even if we have Christ's presence and become Christians, there's this temptation to still look to the things of the world in this in-between space that we li live in now, uh, between you know, Jesus' coming and his return. Um, there's this sense where we look for strongholds. Now, our strongholds might not be a giant mountain range in, in ancient Israel. Our stronghold might not be a foreign king like David going to. 
But I realize there's certain things that we create as strongholds to mitigate our anxiety. It could be our career. It could be that group of friends. It could be that political platform. It could be this identity that we create. It could be that I thought the world was going to be wonderful all the time and just assume that I could get along with my life and not have these changes in the world. I think the shaking that we're seeing in the world is that Christ is, he's, he's, he's dethroned the rulers and principalities. You know, Colossians talks about this. And I think what Christ has done is he's like any stronghold that sets itself against God, even strongholds which initially seem okay, but are things in the created order that have been put above the creator by us. Christ's power comes against those things and it's undermining them all. So this is a great way to reframe what's going on. You know, if your hope is in the stock market, if your hope is is in that politician, if your hope is that you can just sit on the couch and watch sports and it's not going to be interrupted, if you're whatever your hope is in, all of those are being shaken, but that's an invitation to return to the one who gives us the only one who can truly give us a non-anxious presence, so which good. is Christ's presence. So there's an invitation this moment. Is is it frightening? Yes. But in that fear, let's turn again to God who why is Jesus continually saying, Do not be afraid? Like when you if read I encourage people watching, go back and read the gospels and just get a highlighter and mark how many times do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. It's fascinating. And so I think that this moment as we step away from the lure of strongholds and they all shake and they all fall and they look weak. And often what will happen is this one will start to teeter over here. So we'll run to that one. But at the moment, everything, it's like carte blanche. Everything is getting shaken. So that's an invitation to see Christ as our stronghold. That's David's story. That needs to be our story as well. So what I hear you saying is shaking is either going to motivate us to return to the stronghold of hope, as we read in scripture, Mm. or we will build strongholds of self-protection isolation and separateness having cut ourselves off as a branch from the vine we where we will suffocate and atrophy the very potential for which we were created right yes absolutely Mm. Mm. Uh, mark land this plane for us i mean this has been a wildly riveting conversation Mm. for me and and i could spend another three hours with you and uh, and just dive even deeper but um if the architectural plans for strongholds are first drafted in the anxious human heart these are your words Mm. Mm. just drill this down what's our primary responsibility and even perhaps land us with some final words regarding the non-anxious presence yeah look i think i think for the listeners my huge sense is in the midst of all that's going on and the confusion there's a moment and there's a kind of reckoning is it the only reckoning that we have humans face this at different times but when i read the history of i I had this question about five years ago what is the turnaround moment of all these different people billy graham to you know spurgeon to all these different people had these moments all of them got to this particular moment where they could not go on in their own strength (laughs) The strongholds that they invested in, even sometimes these these Christian leaders, um, they just fell apart, you know. And and I think of Dwight Moody. There's a moment he's walking in New York and he's just overwhelmed. And he goes to his friend's house and says, can I just have a bedroom? And goes up to this guy's bedroom and just on his knees, gives his whole heart to God in sort of this collapse moment. Um, you see these moments when people realize that the strongholds that had been crafted in their heart, looking for things apart from God, actually the walls began to teeter and fall at that moment it's an invitation and i think at this moment i'd encourage people you're not the only one going through this i've had conversations with people across the world who are having the same experience who perhaps their friends have walked away from faith perhaps their friends seemingly losing their minds perhaps people they trusted they can't even look to but they're having this singular experience where they're being invited by the holy spirit into a new way forward now, what happens at the beginning of the eight? I talked about William Wilberforce and, and Wesley's and all of that. At the beginning of the 18th century, in the first part of that century, it looked like everything was lost. St. Paul's Cathedral, the massive building in the midst of London, there was an Easter service where something like only six people turned up. The stats for actually the church's attendance then are almost as bad as what they are now in many places in Europe. But then you have 40 or 50 years later, this complete turnaround, this incredible transformation that breaks out in the world, this this renewal, this awakening, that first begins decades earlier, particularly in a bunch of people who are younger, 
where God just starts to put seeds in their heart. You know, I think about Wesley, you know, for the first sort of 10, 20 years of that, a lot of that, he's still a worrisome young guy. <laughs> he's, he's got his little daily habits, but he's still worrisome until he sees, you know, on a voyage across the Atlantic as a failed missionary, you know, the stronghold of even being a missionary fails for him. You know, he sees these Moravians in the midst of a storm, not worried, these non-anxious presences, and is like, I want that. He gets it in London when his heart's strangely warmed in the scriptures. And I think there's a lot of people who some kind of similar thing is happening. It's never super glamorous, but I think in the quiet moments of everything that's happened in the last couple of years, that actually God is planting seeds in people's hearts and God's inviting people to become non-anxious presences, not just as a program, not just as a hack, not just as a habit, but actually something where we begin to dwell in the vine, as you, as you said before, that's where Christ is inviting us. And my, my, my excitement is in the midst of all these miniature moments that people are going through, that's going to be woven together. They're notes in a symphony that God is, that is playing in the world, all across the world. And, and weirdly, the world seems to be getting worse, but I'm more and more excited because these are exactly the moments where God does something new. Oh. Folks, the book, A Non-Anxious Presence by Mark Sayers, How a Changing and Complex World Will Create a Remnant of Renewed Christian Leaders. Listen, I'm telling you guys, this is essential reading, and I say that with humility and, and just great respect for you, Mark. But, uh, guys, this is essential reading, so go to the show notes right now. Get a copy or 20 of Mark's new book and just pass it out. But, uh, Mark, thank you. This has just been riveting, and I'm so um, in admiration of the wisdom and really just the prophetic edge that you brought to the conversation today. So thank you so much. Oh, absolute pleasure to be here. Mm. What a joy. Hey, Mark, I'd love for people to stay connected to you and everything you're doing. Tell people mm. how to do that. Yeah, you can you follow me online. You get markseyers.co um, uh, or find me on Instagram cool. at, uh, at Mark Sayers or my Twitter at Sayers Mark. <laughs> love it. Awesome. Well, again, folks, show notes, wintoday.tv slash episode 301. I'm going to put a link to uh, get a copy of Mark's book as well as various resources from him and then a few of uh, his messages so go there now again win today.tv slash episode 301 mark again thank you so much this has just been a wonderful treat for me oh it's been great thank you for having me <laughs>